Welcome to the Grove School of Engineering Town Hall. This is quite a historic time for us. Not only are we approaching the end of our 100th anniversary, we are doing so in the midst of a pandemic. And first and foremost, we want to wish everyone well. I hope that you and all of your families are staying safe and well. And secondly, we really want to congratulate the Grove School community on how well it's done in response to the pandemic that we're in now. The whole community was able to pivot on a dime and move to online instruction and move to doing other things to support one another in ways we never even imagined as we move forward. We've been very careful on how we stay true to our mission and how we support our students and one another in the community. In today's town hall, we'd like to share some goings on within the Grove School and predict out somewhat of a pathway for our future. So if we could have the next slide, please. By way of review over the year, we've had quite a productive year. Our faculty and our students have continued to guard or awards and recognition throughout the country. We've been a highly sought partner in research and education collaborations, having many partners across the country, many of whom have sought us out in particular for our expertise, for the contributions that we've made and continue to make in science, education, and research, for the work that our students do, and to work with our uh, expert faculty. We have some new programming that we've undertaken this year, and I believe many of our students in particular have participated. One of them is our executive in residence program. Our first ever executive is Dr. Tilak Agarwala. He's a retired uh, executive from IBM. He's been working with our students in terms of professional development, and he's also been sharing his expertise and presenting scientific communications as well. We would like to expand this program and bring in additional experts from other um, arenas and other disciplines. Next slide. As you know, we are all in the midst of the pandemic, but it's important to point out just how strong Grove School has been in its uh, responses. We've had a successful transition to online instruction starting on March 19th. And our faculty and our students were actually expected to and came through and pivoting on a dime and moving the whole operation uh, to a remote setting. We've had lots of questions, but also we've had lots of uh, feedback on the way the community has come together uh, on advisement and, and uh, working towards how to deliver the instructions. You'll hear more of that in the presentation that will follow mine from Associate Dean Artie Walzer. And you'll hear more about uh, research from Associate Dean uh, Rosemary Wesson. We'd like to highlight in particular, um, in terms of essential personnel, Luis Hernandez has worked single-handedly to keep our building and our uh, occupants safe and to be the one conduit between us and the rest of the world, actually, as we uh, had all moved uh, remotely off of the campus. Our Grove School faculty and our students have been very instrumental in helping lead the way to the uh, COVID response. We'd like to highlight some of those particular efforts, such as that by Jeff Garanich, he led the effort to manufacture headbands and face shields and other personal protective equipment using 3D printers to reduce the risk of infection for healthcare workers fighting COVID-19. In chemical engineering, Alexander Kousis and Sanjoy Banerjee were using their Grove School spinoff company, Urban Electric Power, to create much needed hand sanitizer. They use their company to, uh, in a way that they repurpose a portion of its manufacturing line to address the inadequate supply of hand sanitizer. 
that's essential for uh, essential personnel and others. And this was used throughout the area. Also from biomedical engineering, Luis Cardoso worked in his lab on pre perfecting a device that could retrofit outdated and manual bag ventilators. This would definitely help address the shortage of ventilators. And finally, we had a number of graduating civil engineering students who stepped to the plate to help set up mobile uh, medical facilities. Next slide, please. We talk a little bit about transitioning forward. We will have an interim dean appointed effective July 1. This summer, I think most people already know that summer courses have been moved to be online only. In the fall, we are following the lead of the city, the City University of New York system and the governor in terms of what we can and can't do. And we're expecting that we'll have some combination of both online and on-site instruction. We are looking at the timeline for how we revamp research activity. Plans are being made. Each department is developing plans specific to its discipline and you'll hear more details from um, Dean Wesson. And lastly, in terms of some of the exciting things that are happening uh, with Grove School at the center, we will be featured in Behind the Scenes with Lawrence Fishburne. This is a program that's put out by PBS where they do small documentaries to highlight service and other contributions of institutions entities, organizations across the country. This year, there's a focus on education, and we at the Grove School will be highlighted based on the types of work that we do, the students that we educate, and the important things that our students go on to do, including the work of uh, our faculty as well. This program actually um, is distributed throughout the entire nation, all 50 states. And the reader, the viewership is expected to be about 600 million. So this is a great way for Grove to be featured and recognized for the important work that it does and to have that recognition throughout the country. Very much a testament to the quality and expertise of our faculty, students, and the staff who work with them. And if I could have the next slide. In terms of commemorating our graduates. We expect that there'll be a college-wide salute to the scholars in June. The date has not yet been announced. We plan on having a virtual commencement for uh, Grove School of Engineering on Friday, June 5th. Like to thank Rollins Bahari and Annette Pineda for their leadership in that effort. More details will come. Our tradition of having the Order of the Engineer will still take place in coordination with our engineering school alumni. And if I could have my final slide, we want to give a special congratulations to the Grove School class of 220, class of 2020, valedictorian and salutatorians from civil engineering, we have Anissa Logica, and from chemical engineering as a salutatorian, we have Sylvia Skimite. And these students were selected from a, a very competitive process. All of the candidates were outstanding. It was difficult to make this selection, but it just speaks to the quality and the level of contributions that our students make. And congratulations to both of these outstanding students who you will hear from later in their roles of valedictorian and salutatorian. And with that, I'd like to end my comments and turn the platform over to Associate Dean Artie Walzer. So is Associate Dean Artie Walzer going next? Yes. Artie? I just got in. <laughs> I don't know, for some reason, didn't like me. 
Anyway, just want to uh, thank everyone for joining us, particularly our students, and we just met with our faculty. And so uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. And so first of all, I just want to uh, commend uh, our whole uh, School of Engineering community for just doing an extraordinary job in dealing with this pandemic. And um, I've already shared some of this with our faculty, so I'll go very quickly through that and uh, move on to the things that are more germane to our students. And um, one of the things is about the well-being, your health, your emotional, mental, and spiritual health, that there's a lot of resources that are offered to our faculty through the Division of Human Resources and also to our students, you know, in terms of dealing with some of the stresses that occur because of this pandemic. And, um, you know, uh, our students are already uh, somewhat stressed because of the type of work that you do and being in an engineering program is not the easiest thing. And then when you have this along with all the other sort of challenges that come along with that, um, sometimes we need a little help to kind of make it through. And so just want to make everyone aware of this uh, resource that's available to each of our students. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, concern about the flexible grading policy, and I apologize for the density of this. Um, we were, uh, the advisors were given from CUNY uh, the 10 things that all advisors need to know, so I pared it down for faculty. The short and long of it for our students is that you get to decide on whether you use the uh, credit or no credit policy, and um, you have 20 days in order to do that uh, after the final uh, grade submission deadline. And, um, but I would say, I would strongly encourage you to please speak with your advisors, you know, um, so to make sure that that is the best option for you, particularly if you're going to graduate and looking at graduate schools or going to look to go to other programs, that um, it, um, there are some nuances in the application of that policy. And so we want you to be thoughtful about that. And in terms of those who have uh, found themselves with uh, academically challenged, the, um, just want to sort of bring up the appeals process, which is pretty much the same, except that everything is done online. Um, students might find themselves with an academic hole, either because of their GPA, you know, GPA probation, or Q QPA probation, or advisement. And uh, if you should find yourself in that situation, um, one just needs to uh, submit your appeal, and um, there's the link for that appeal. Um, I believe we've been using that for quite a while now, and so now that's become our primary mode of uh, communication. Our, um, I want to just say a few things about um, our new advising mode. You know, um, um, before uh, the pandemic, um, we, most, we had a great deal of face-to-face uh, -face meetings with our students in terms of advisement. There were office hours, and now all of that is really gone to be done more remotely. And these are the primary modes of, uh, of, of advising, either by phone, uh, by email, by Skype. Uh, FaceTime or Zoom, and uh, depending on the size of the program and the number of students that an advisor have, uh, they might offer you any of these five, and, may, and there are other um, possibilities as well. The key thing is that we want to keep you informed and also um, make sure that you know that we support you in all that you do, and want to make sure that you're successful, and we want to do everything in our power to keep those lines of communication. This is the initial sort of attempt, but now we're looking down the road because um, we have no idea how this thing is going to play out in the years to come. And so we want to sort of strengthen this sort of online types of communication. And so um, a, a number of our faculty, I mean, a number of our students, our advisors are looking for other ways of doing that. Um, in terms of our PhD and master's degree students, um, a lot of the advising really took place via phone or through emails. Um, and so while there were some um, in-office meetings, very often a lot of it was through um, some sort of di distance connection. The key thing that I really want to point out that sort of make the biggest difference here is uh, one, that for our PhD programs, all of the forms that you receive in regards to your dissertation, your first or second exam or transfer credit have all been revised by um, our director of graduate program, uh, Ms. Belkis Boudre, such that they are not only fillable, but also they can receive digital signals. So uh, those forms would be completed, submitted to her, and then she would make sure that I would get them place a digital signature and sort of move them along so that there's nothing impeding you uh, after you've done your defense of uh, attaining your degree. The thing that I want to point out to all of our undergraduates is that, uh, particularly if you're seniors, and um, you know the situation, the job market has changed, our internships have changed, that we've extended our deadline for those who are interested in graduate school to July 1st. 
And so we encourage you to take advantage of that because you always want to be in the mode of increasing your skill and your certification. And um, can't think of a better place to do that. And so we want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, uh, as I was uh, referring to earlier regarding the way that we do advisement, right now, um, all of it is on online or uh, through some sort of distance, either through phone or email. We're looking at other ways, sort of strengthening our professional development for advisors to find other modes to stay connected with you, our students, uh, whether graduate or undergraduate. And so these are some of the workshops that our faculty, uh, I'm sorry, that our advisors and possibly even faculty members will take advantage of in terms of strengthening their skills and finding better ways to communicate with our students and to keep you engaged. Now I've moved on to some of the things that are still going on. Um, some of you have um, are aware, particularly our faculty and our graduate students and also undergraduates in terms of the executive or resident lecture series with Dr. Uh, Tylek Agarwala. And um, there've been a number of those um, and we've went from being in the lecture hall to doing them online. And um, they've been very successful and actually we really appreciate our students participating because they really bring a certain youthful excitement and uh, asking those really good questions that we really truly appreciate. But also we think that uh, it's an opportunity for all our students and for our faculty and college community as a whole to take advantage of someone like Dr. Akawala, who has a distinguished career in industry and um, are asking all kinds of uh, big questions, not just about technology itself, but its impact on society, on how do we live, on how do we do those things. And one such uh, topic was the interdisciplinary response to emerging challenges our very own Dean Gilda Barabino and um, Dean uh, Andrew Rich uh, were the panelists and it was a very rich conversation and um, these are the things that we need to be thinking about as engineers as scientists and as members of the wider community after all we're engineers because we want to make society a lot better and by using our technology our know-how and our our cultural uh, competencies we then make products that make the world a little bit better and so um, there have also been informational sessions for you to get involved with in terms of internships, we've had uh, professional folks that come out. I want to give a shout out to uh, Claude Brathwaite, who's been uh, spearheading this and making sure that we bring out a lot of talented folks who have a great deal of experience to share with our students and to keep you engaged and keep you ahead of the curve in terms of what's coming down the pike as you uh, develop in your career. Uh, in that same way, um, as uh, some of you have already experienced, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically to our students, that a number of the internships and job offers have changed um, because of the climate and companies have had different um, um, attitudes about that and dealing with some of their challenges. Um, what, has, uh, what has occurred is that uh, Dr. Um, Brathway, along with a number of our faculty members, Professor Faradun Dalali, um, former Dean Joseph Barber, and Professor Jorge Gonzalez, as well as myself, have a number of programs that are available to you that you can actually do online. In fact, uh, with the CPAS program, which you cannot see in this, uh, and, um, and all with um, Professor Dalal and Professor Barber, there are like 50 some odd opportunities for our students to take advantage of to do internships over the summer. And so we encourage you to really look into that and to take advantage of that. We also have the ICCAE, which is basically the uh, Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence, of which we, the Grove School, have with Syracuse. Opportunities for you to also take advantage of those as well as um, the Lewis Stoke program, which has been an ongoing program, which has been here at the college for at least 25 years and continues on. And so we want to encourage our students to really look into that. And you can reach out to Dr. Brathwaite if you have any uh, uh, interest in those sorts of things. In fact, we encourage you to please reach out to them whether you have an interest or not, because we think that you should, because these are the things that help develop your skills and your uh, professional acumen as you go out into the, into the world. Um, the final thing that I wanted to sort of give you a heads up about, and I want to give a shout out to our Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, uh, Mr. Rollins Bahari, and for Annette Pineda, and for everyone who's been involved with sort of setting up our virtual commencement. Um, it will be a Zoom uh, virtual commencement. We'll try to keep the speeches to a minimum, uh, at least that's the instructions I was given by those of us who are sort of, I guess, principal players, but really to have it focus on you, our graduates, um, our undergraduate graduates, as well as our graduate students, master's and PhD programs. And the date is for June 5th, 2020 at uh, 12 noon. And so we'll leave it at that and I'll turn it over to, uh, if Rose hasn't spoke already, I'll hand it over to her. Thank you, Ari. Let's see if I can share my screen.
Uh, yeah, town hall. All right, thank you guys. Um, I'm Rose Wesson, Associate Dean for Research, and I'm going to talk about what we have been looking at as how to uh, restart research. And let me make me full screen. And just thinking. And how am I going to advance my slide? There we go. So you may have heard that we're talking about phasing in research. So what we've been talking to CUNY about is decoupling the campus return for in-person classroom instruction from the campus return for doing research. We're still in those conversations. We have not been 100% um, approved, but we're very close. So, so we think we are going to be able to start back with research prior to our in-classroom instruction, in-person classroom instruction. What we want to stress here is that it will be a phasing in process and that everything we do has to be done safely. So what we will probably have is an overarching theme for City College and then building specific guidelines for, for instance, uh, Steinman or Marshak or CDI or even ASRC. So what we envision the overarching guidelines to include are masks, is that everyone will be required to have a face mask, some kind of a face mask, in order to enter the buildings. The social distancing will be maintained in the labs as well as in the building. And then just regular safety that we've always had, for instance, our up-to-date C14 certifications, if any one of those have expired since we've been out of the building, then those have to be uh, recertified. You have to be, um, have a possess an active certificate. We're working in conjunction with CUNY, ASRC, and the Science Division so that we're trying to make this as uniform as possible. And it is a gradual phased approach. So what do I mean by a gradual phased approach? This is an example. And I keep saying that just, just to show you what we have in mind, we have these different phases in mind. And you may also be familiar with CUNY has phases associated with COVID-19 research. These phases don't necessarily match up. These are numbers that we're putting in just to show that it's a gradual process. Um, they may change, but this is an illustrative example. So phase zero is where we were, meaning that we were, were essential personnel only, only the people in Steinman were people that were doing maybe COVID-19 related research, and then people that needed to be there for maintenance of the building. We're trying to move in, and I think we are, we're in phase one right now as associated on this chart. Phase one is the planning and preparation for phased reopening. So that's what we're talking about now. We're having those discussions. We're trying to get to phase two. Phase two is where we're thinking we might be able to do time sensitive re research or field based research. And the numbers down below are just representative, meaning we're thinking maybe a quarter of the people will be back into the labs, be back into the building for phase two. It may only be 10%. Those are flexible numbers. After phase two, we think if things go well, we can have further gradual ramp up of research and maybe even start doing some in-person human subjects re related research. And maybe about 50% of people will be back into the building. And then the phase four reflects our new normal where whatever the new normal looks like, our campus researchers will be able to return to the building. It may not be 100%. That may be our new normal. But what we're saying is if you can work remotely, if you can perform your research remotely, you should continue to perform your research remotely. 
We're only looking at phasing in research that cannot be performed off camp or on campus. We're looking at phasing in research that cannot be performed off campus or it must be done partially in a lab. You'll also notice that those arrows go back and forth. We hope to proceed from left to right, but if things don't go well, then we may have to go back a couple of phases. So phase one, that's where we are now. We're thinking about equipment preparation. If we are going back in the lab, what equipment do we need? Uh, what uh, PPE do we need? Do we need to reorder personal protective equipment? What additional personnel do we need? There will be training. EHOS is developing COVID-19 health and safety related training for everyone that's coming back into the building. That training will have to take place prior to going into the labs. And then we also have to obtain approval to conduct the on-site research. That's what we're doing now in phase one. So phase two, phase two we're thinking about any kind of research where um, a delay will, a continued delay will result in data loss a disruption of efforts, data collection, some kind of loss or delay if you don't get back into that lab immediately. Phase two would be prioritized in terms of seasonal or data collection, field work. You have to do something in the month of June. You have to go up and take air samples, or if you miss this, your research will be delayed a year. Long-term longitudinal studies are being looked at to potentially start early. If you've been out and you need to take some data because you've been running this experiment for months, for years, and you still need to get that data in order to continue the experiment, those types of experiments will be um, prioritized. And then animal experiments we think can begin again in phase two. Where is if you, if you delayed, you might lose your colony. Um, there may be euthanasia involved. So those would be prioritized as well. Other options in phase two, um, graduate students that are close to completion or postdocs that need to be on campus because their uh, appointments are ending. Externally funded research that might have deadlines. So NSF and NIH have been very understanding, so to speak, about the delays in research due to COVID-19. Some other agencies may not have been as understanding and there are contract deadlines. For instance, Department of Defense has contract deadlines. And so if you need to meet those deadlines, then that may be a reason to prioritize your research and why you need to get back into the lab. Also, we've been paying our graduate students as we've been out, but some funding agencies are saying that if there's no work, then there will be no pay. So our students have been doing data analysis, they've been doing literature survey, surveys, they've been completing activities that can be done remotely. But if there's an agency that is looking at you need to have data in order to pay your students, those will be prioritized as well. And finally, untenured faculty research. We're asking that departments look at that and see if that's another area that um, should be prioritized over other research. So this is currently under discussion. We don't have any forms yet, but we in, what we envision is that there will be an eligibility form. So what we have asked is that department chairs have put in prioritization based on their needs in their department. But once those are reviewed, there'll be an eligibility form that each PI will be asked to complete. That completed form will be given to the department chair. And basically that's where the approvals are, will be needed. It will be reviewed by the Dean and also reviewed by the Provost 
However, that's just, in our mind, informational. Now, if the dean or the provost said, no, 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 this shouldn't happen, then yes, they will have the final say. But most likely, the department chair is where, where that decision will be made. And as I said, the forms are currently under discussion. We envision this to be a remote form so that you can fill it out electronically and it can be submitted electronically. All right, that's, I think, what I wanted to say about restarting research, phasing in research. We don't have any timelines on this. What we're trying to do is to be ready. So when CUNY, well, when the state, the city, and CUNY say, okay, you can, do, you can start phasing in research, we'll be ready to go back in. Will it be next week? I guarantee you it will not be next week. Will it be the first week in June? Will it be the second week in June? Will it be July? We can't say. What we're trying to do is get ready to phase in the research. All right, so the next, before I take up too much time, I wanna introduce Andrew Wooten. He has been hired in the president's office as a director of innovation management. This is a position that's been funded by a donor gift and it's a two-year appointment. So I actually met with him last week and he's tasked to form partnerships between faculty and students, business, industry, private foundations, very interested in entrepreneurial ideas. So if you have a small business or if you're thinking about a small business, he wants to hear from you. He was the former VP of commercialization in Cincinnati at the Children's Hospital. And what we are trying to do in the Grove School of Engineering this week is to put together faculty research profiles. So people who have entrepreneurial ideas, people who have connections with industry, and people who may have local, <coughs> excuse me, city and state connections and feed that information to uh, Andrew. If you want, we're compiling that based on the information that we have, but if you want to send me additional information that you think I may not be aware of, feel free to send it to me. Uh, we will vet this by the department chairs before going to Andrew, but we're trying to get this completed this week so that he can start making those connections with Grove School faculty where he might enhance the actual collaborations with outside entities. I will stop at this point, I think. Oh no, I've got one more thing to say. Uh, before I get to this, I didn't make a slide on communications. Um, you may have seen we have a research update. Thank you, Annette, for putting that out weekly. Hint, hint, today is Tuesday. Um, <laughs> to put that out weekly. And what we like to do is highlight our faculty, our students who are doing exceptional research within the Grove School. If you've received uh, funding that you'd like to have highlighted, if you're doing research that you'd like to have highlighted, if you have a collaboration that you'd like to have highlighted, we'd like to hear from you so that we can, we can put that into our research updates, which come out weekly. All right. Last thing is Steinman Access. We've talked about ramping up research, but it has not happened yet. Steinman is still closed. And the only personnel allowed in the building are Luis Hernandez and Dean Barabino. If you need to have access to the building, then you should contact either me, Dean Barabino, or Tony Liss. And that's on an occasional basis if you need access into Steinman. Otherwise, you're classified as an unauthorized access person, and that's prohibited. I will say again, and I'm going to read this from uh, President Boudreau. It, it, he put it out in one of his communications. I'm establishing these access restrictions to meet the requirements of a grave public health crisis and none of us has the right, the right to risk the lives of others by violating them. If you somehow gain access to a restricted space on campus, and that's unauthorized access, 
I, meaning President Boudreaux, will view this as a serious violation of campus safety policy and utilize the disciplinary machinery at my disposal to drive home the point. We cannot relax our guard. Things are improving in the city. Things may be improving on campus, but we still have to be vigilant in terms of staying home and not going into Steinman with unauthorized access. I'm done. Thank you. So I did have some questions, but how do you want to do this, Rollins or Annette? You can go ahead and address the questions until Rollins gets them from the audience. Okay, so the questions that I had that were submitted ahead of time. What are the steps for the different phases of opening? I think I've addressed that. What are the hours, days that the building will be open and available for research? So we don't have specific hours. Initially, we were thinking of nine to five, but due to the density, we feel like you will have access to the building um, in the evenings. You will have access to the building on the weekends. We're asking that people who do go in don't necessarily believe you're gonna have eight hours of access. Um, it may be staggered access so that we can get the most people in with the least amount of density. But we'll figure that out by the end of this week as to what has been submitted and then uh, provide additional information. Do laboratories still have appropriate PPE? CUNY has agreed to supply uh, personal protection equipment because we did give a lot of our equipment away in the early stages of the virus. I do, however, recommend that we might want to start ordering and maybe it can be replaced by what CUNY has provided. But I think we should prepare ourselves to go in that once we're ready, we're ready to go in. We've got everything that we need. Um, how will deliveries be handled for Steinman? As I said, um, Luis Hernandez is there on Mondays and Wednesdays and Right now, the deliveries are taking place and receiving. Specific deliveries to Steinman are possible, but it's helpful to coordinate it with Lewis. So as we start ordering more PPE, we will funnel Lewis into that equation so that he can receive that equipment, those, those uh, personal protection equipments. I think, um, I think that's it. I'll, I'll stop right there. Artie, did you have some questions that you had ahead of time? No, I did not. Artie, there's a question now. It's, there was a question about whether the PhD application deadline was also extended. Uh, yes, um, we said graduate, we mean the whole thing. So yes, July 1st. Great. Artie, another question was um, whether there will be financial assistance from Grove to students who will need to take summer classes to make up for what they did not get done in spring 2020? Uh, we have no information to that end. Actually, um, because of COVID, the whole college, the whole university, the whole state is really talking about some of the financial challenges, um, but we have nothing at this point. Another question is, is there going to be any discount on summer courses? Uh, I have no information uh, to that end. Um, it wouldn't, our office would not actually handle that sort of stuff. That would actually be probably the, finan the chief financial officer the, uh, and the Bursas office would be the folks. But we'll see what we can do to find out, you know, uh, get uh, answers to those questions for the people who handle those sorts of things. Are there any other questions from the participants? You can send them via chat. So I've got another one. 
uh, what is being done to continue undergraduate research experiences and training safely. So as for undergraduates, um, any research that is being done, particularly over the summer, we're, we're looking at doing it remotely. Um, there may be an opportunity to get back into the labs as early as fall for the undergraduates, but we're unsure. So there are a number of opportunities, and I think uh, Professor Delali and Professor Gonzalez, they have, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Brathwaite, have put out a number of announcements regarding summer opportunities, and I think Dr. Walser can speak to this as well for undergraduates, but those would be remote activities in terms of research. Another question, will the in-person 2020 commencement be postponed to a later date or is it canceled? Um, the answer to that question is we don't know. I mean, I, I think the real challenge here is, is, and a lot of this goes all the way up to the state in terms of the governor stating whether or not it's appropriate that um, we um, sort of relax some of the things that are going on. It depends on, of course, epidemiologists and how, you know, how uh, much control has been uh, taken in terms of the COVID uh, pandemic, at least in the local area. So it's still questionable. I think the dates that might have been put out there have been very tentative and optimistic. Thank you. Are new PhD students still scheduled to start in August? Um, I would say yes, but you know, I put a big question mark with that because it depends on how, I mean, um, if the, for most of our PhD students, they'll be taking coursework, so that can be done remotely. The real challenge becomes is if you're an experimentalist and you need to be in a physical lab. Um, so uh, by and large, yes, we're we'll looking to start um, in the fall. Okay, following up on that, how will in-person in lab sessions for courses be instructed? Um, and it really depends on the program that you're in. Um, some of the programs, the equipment is, is large, and so as a result, you can't really do it in um, person, and you can't do it remotely. For example, with electrical engineering, in order to handle some of the, uh, the basic labs, they actually uh, had purchased kits um, in order to try to do some of the uh, more um, demanding labs where you have a higher level or more expensive equipment, it's going to require significant investment by the university or the college in terms of putting in the type of uh, technology that you need to do this sort of, uh, uh, to have this sort of experiential sort of learning through labs. So uh, we're sort of working that out as we're sort of moving along. A lot of it, unfortunately, is tied to having the appropriate funding to roll into the appropriate technology to be able to to recreate remotely that thing that you would do in a physical lab. Thank you. How will club activities be affected, especially clubs that are part of national competitions? That's still to be decided. I mean, once again, you know, um, when we think about this pandemic, it's the whole planet. It's not just New York. And um, just so that you know, even a lot of the professional conferences have had to switch um, travel has been banded, you know, no one gets to travel anywhere, at least not, and, and actually that has been um, a policy of the university as well as the state. And so uh, all of this sort of plays into that as we sort of uh, readjust to this new normal. And I would imagine a lot of these things might be taking uh, place virtually. Is there an estimated deadline for when undergraduates can expect a decision about fall semester being online or in person? Uh, we're waiting to hear that ourselves. I think that, you know, that decision goes several levels up. You know, early today we heard from our president who has been talking to the chancellor, who's been talking to the governor. And so all of that sort of plays into what we not only are able to do, but what we'll be allowed to do. And so uh, we don't have a definitive answer for that. How uh, let me just say this, I just want to say that, you know, the thing that's driving a lot of this, this decision is that we really want to make sure that all our students and our faculty and our whole community are safe. That is really the overlying thing here. I mean, we would love to start and get back to it, um, but, you know, we can't do that at this point and ensure that people are safe. And so we think that people's health is the primary thing. Um, 
I'm sure that some of you uh, may have had relatives who've been very negatively impacted, particularly if they're over a certain age. And so we really need to sort of think about um, the whole community and meaning, you know, the whole range in terms of the impact of this, this uh, pandemic. Will the credit, no credit grading policy be extended for the summer and fall 2020 semesters? We've had no word on that. Right now it's just for spring 2020. That was uh, voted on by the uh, Board of Trustees of CUNY. Um, they may extend it, but uh, we had no word on that. But definitely for spring 2020, it's in place. How will the order of the engineer ceremony and ring presentation be held? I'll pass it over to our assistant dean, Rollins Bahari. Um, the order of the engineer, we, con we consulted with the national organization. And what is the case is that um, we will do the oath or the obligation at our ceremony, our virtual ceremony, and it will be followed up with the rings afterwards. And all students will be invited to any live um, ceremony that we have next year so that they can participate in person. But for right now, for students who would not be able to return next year, they should participate in our virtual ceremony where the obligation of the engineer will, will take place and they will be inducted into the order of the engineer. Any additional questions? Well, I've got some, Annette, that are in the q and I don't know why they haven't rolled over to where you are. Okay. Do you have one you can answer? You can go ahead. I don't know if I can answer it. <laughs> well, if you read it. <laughs> we'll no, it says, um, it says, how can, I, how can we arrange for instruments to be packaged and shipped out for servicing, repair, or calibration? <laughs> uh, talk with your department chair. I, I, I don't know, but we can uh, talk to your department chair and uh, um, we can handle that one offline. There's another one that had, um, when the phase in return to campus begins, besides the PPE needs, will viral tests also be offered for faculty, staff, and students before they return to campus? So we have had the discussions about taking temperatures and uh, monitoring people as they come into the building. Um, we, as, as City College, have not coalesced on that. Where we are now is that we're asking people to self-monitor, that if you feel that you're not well, that you do not come to campus. Um, we are, we're not thinking about the taking temperatures in the, in the building because one, there, there are instances where temperature does not reflect whether you are affected or not. So we're not sure that's gonna be uh, an effective route. Um, there was another question here about, are there talks on disinfecting the entire building, especially labs? So yes, um, um, a physical plant has and will continue to disinfect the building. So there are, there will be hand sanitizers, there will be sanit sanitizers at the elevators, at the stairwells, um, outside the restrooms, and before anyone is allowed back in the building in, in terms of the research phase in, the entire building will be wiped down and disinfected. Will there be a standard developed for administering online lectures and exams for the upcoming fall semester? I think that, uh, well, I don't think the, the, the school is working on that. And when I say the school, not just the School of Engineering, but actually the entire college. And um, that's why I made reference earlier to some of the professional development that's, um, that's available to advisors, a similar sort of thing for our faculty in terms of finding best practices. Now, whether that happens by fall, that might be a little bit challenging because I think we're still sort of reeling from the fact that we've had to make this transition in a matter of days. And so um, that takes some time. And also, you know, there are some um, uh, best practices when it comes to that. And uh, one, to learn that and then to implement that are two different things. But um, we, what we hope as we move forward, we'll become uh, more standardized and get better at sort of handling this. And, you know, once again, I say this is a worldwide sort of issue. And so we have a lot of company in terms of people that we can work with 
to sort of figure out what those best practices are. How are FedEx and UPS deliveries being handled if no one is available in Stimon? So uh, we're coordinating with Luis Hernandez. So he, he has been there and it has been receiving FedEx and UPS deliveries. We imagine as we start to repopulate the building, those will increase, but we're coordinating those efforts through um, Luis Hernandez. Will 2020 and 2021 students graduate at the same time? Will there be a joint ceremony? We, um, students are going to be graduating once they met the requirements of graduation. So in terms of graduation itself, that's in terms of their academic degrees. So once they finish with all of the requirements that is needed for, for their degree, they will graduate on time, meaning in the sense of if they're graduating at the end of this semester, they will have a graduation date of May, June 2020. In terms of the actual graduation ceremony, we are planning to have an in-person if the health situation is good next year for the class of 2021. And all students from this year would also be invited to that ceremony, but we will definitely be having a virtual ceremony this year because some students would not be able to return next year. Thank you. Following up on the delivery of packages, the question is, is this only on Mondays and Wednesdays? So as we start to ramp up, then we will have people in the building more often. I won't say Monday through Friday, but we'll have people in the building more often. So it will be more than Mondays and Wednesdays. Okay. Are the bathroom faucets being upgraded so that we can wash our hands? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that question, but I certainly do hope so. <laughs> Uh, sorry. That's uh, a good question. What are you talking about? That's a great question. Um, Others have asked that question as well. So, so, so the, the answer, that question has been asked numerous times. Yes. And the answer that we receive is that paper towels will be available so that you can turn on and off the faucets using the paper towels so that you don't have to touch the faucets anymore. However, I don't, I highly, I don't believe that the faucets will be upgraded. Okay. How about disinfecting the ventilation systems? And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We have to check with physical plant services. I mean, this effect does you, clean the whole nine yards. I would hope that that would actually be part of our protocol before we're bringing people back. It's an opportunity to really take care of a lot of these issues. Okay. In the meantime, are we going to continue to run forced air? I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I would imagine they would. They've been doing it for decades. Um, but I would, you know, make that point known to the folks who handle that. I guess that would be more in your, in your belly with Rose, with the physical. So yes, we have, we have talked about the forced air. Um, there are filters involved, um, but that point will be made to physical plant. That's all I can say. Will they be cleaning staff offices, common areas where pe when, before people return? So, um, we have asked that question and haven't gotten a straight answer. What I know is that um, prior to the virus, they were not cleaning offices. So I in particular will clean my office when I go in, no matter what, um, if they have cleaned it or not, I will clean my own office in terms of wiping down the surfaces. The labs, yes, they will be um, cleaned, but uh, I can't guarantee the individual offices will be cleaned. How is graduation honors being handled? Um, once the student has met the requirements for honors for graduation, that will be denoted on their transcript. I think what has also been asked is that in the past we have had um, rope like a, a rope that goes around the student in terms to denote that they're graduating with honors. We have um, asked the college to purchase that. And if they have already ordered it, what is gonna happen is that would either be posted to the students or it would be used for next year's ceremony for those that cannot return. 
What is the timeline for the degree posting on a transcript? Um, well, for this semester, because students will have the option to go for no credit or credit, that falls within the month of June. So even though we are supposed to submit certifications, meaning the Grove School of Engineering by June the 5th, what is the case is there may be some variations a couple of weeks after that. So the date will still probably be the May, June 2020. However, in terms of resolving the actual um, requirements for the degree, it may continue towards the end of June. So the actual transcript may reflect it if the person has already graduated earlier, but if there are any students with any outstanding problems, it may be reflected a little bit more into June. So I've got one, Annette, and then you might. How do, I'm sorry. How do we practice social distancing in the elevator? Yeah, I didn't point that out. Um, the elevators, the small elevator, and I don't know the numbers of the elevators, but if you're facing the bank, the small elevator all the way to the right, I'm sorry, to the left, if you're facing the bank all the way to the left, will be a one person only elevator. The other elevators will be two people maximum per elevator. And then there's always the option of the stairs. Which gets crowded too. Mm -hmm. will, they, will they be installing automatic paper towel dispensers in the bathrooms? Mm. I actually believe the answer is yes. Um, that was discussed and I believe that was approved. Thank you. Why not install UV light sterilizers in the air handling system? That will be put on the list of things to consider. Any additional questions? Will there be course evaluation, professor evaluations sent this semester? How are these evaluations reviewed and taken into account? Don't know. Um, that generally doesn't come from academic affairs. Um, so not sure about that. At the provost office level, there's a discussion about not doing the evaluations. Okay. And uh, when there's a final decision, we'll definitely pass that on. Okay. Sam Fenster um, contributed to the chat. He said he read that there will be no evaluations this term. Thank you. Okay. And anonymous attendee uh, wanted to say that any surface that have not been touched for weeks are naturally decontaminated. However, somebody also chimed in and said that um, there may be mice droppings. <laughs> <laughs> or dirt. <laughs> <laughs> These are people who really know the place. So I have after three. How long? Any long. Oh, okay. So I have another question. Civil engineering completed evaluations via online anonymous forms. So that, that may have been just within the department. But I, I think that's an in-house survey. That's in-house. How will unfair grading in civil engineering be handled? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, they have to define unfair grading. There was an email sent by HR on Friday, May 15th, that indicated that non-teaching adjuncts will be receiving end of assignment notices to be effective July 1st. Okay. This will, of course, affect the NYSHIP health insurance coverage for many of our graduate students. I understand there's an effort to exempt those students. Has anyone heard if that exemption has been approved? I have not. I have not heard yet. I, don't want to be I, I didn't want to be dismissive about the unfair grading. We would hope that the grading would be fair and that people treat it well. It's hard to answer that question from our level here. I mean, that 
the grading is uh, dictated really uh, by the faculty and then also the new policy, the, uh, the, uh, the flexible policy with the grading, the credit, no credit. And that's as about as far as it goes. Now, if you feel that something is, is a missed, you can certainly uh, approach me or uh, your undergraduate dean and uh, we can look into that. But uh, those are serious charges. And so there would be considerable evidence to sort of support whether or not that actually happened because we want folks to be graded appropriately. Related to- In addition to contacting the associate and, and assistant deans, students should first start with their department chairs mm -hmm. and raise those issues to, to their attention. And there is a process by which if someone actually wants to file a complaint to start with the chair and have an understanding of what happened. But also students and faculty need to understand that there really are academic rights, academic freedom for the faculty and their student rights. And a lot of that is detailed in CUNY guidelines. Thank you. Okay. Also on civil engineering grading, why was civil engineering not allowed to curve exams while other departments were? I don't understand that question. I mean, it's not that someone's stopping someone from curving. In fact, in general, I mean, if truth be told, curving is sort of the prerogative of the instructor. There is no policy that I'm aware of that, it, that says an instructor has to curve or cannot curve. What we ask is that they be fair. Is there any word on how CUNY pass-fail options affects the future PE, PE licensure? Um, not clear. I mean, the thing with this is that with any sort of new policy, particularly when it's done as quickly as this was done, there is always the possibility of unforeseen consequences. This is why we think it's very important that you speak with your advisor to talk about your specific case so we can sort of consider, you know, what might be the long term impact of invoking that or not. Okay, from an instructor, if we have to teach online in the fall, how do we better design a new paradigm? That's where that training comes in, you know, where we get to learn from folks who do online training. I mean, it's not the same thing as doing in class. And so we're all going to be on a learning curve, just as I am as a dean in terms of advising. Um, and so um, I've signed up for that workshop that you saw I posted um, so that we can sort of learn from people who already do this. Um, a good source is the Continuing Education, Juan Carlos, where they have, um, they have a lot of online experience just so, that, so that we can up our game in sort of delivering the uh, information in an effective way remotely. And there is a CETL at the college, which is for training instructors, as well as staff in terms of online technologies. So it's just that instructors and adjuncts have to take advantage of the, um, the opportunities and resources that are already on campus. Yeah, that, that's in the NAC building. And they, but the, it's actually gonna be online. They actually have a bunch of courses that are available. That's the Center for Teaching and Learning. Excellent. Yeah. Are there research opportunities available while the college is closed? There, there are some online um, ones that we talked about earlier. It depends on what they mean by that. So do you, if they mean undergraduate research experiences, so to speak. So mm -hmm. yes, there, there, there are. Um, I'm not sure the deadlines are probably really close. Um, um, Professor Gonzalez, uh, Professor Delali. Claude Brathwaite, those are very good people to get in touch with in terms of potential uh, research opportunities. But you get a lot of emails to that effect as well, you know, so you can right. really get in contact with them and can connect you. But you can also connect with your faculty members, just general faculty members, to see if they also might have um, potential funding or an experience where you could work remotely as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, over the summer. Um, you should also look at your emails, your city mail account, because there are lots of opportunities that actually go to your city mail account. However, some of their deadlines may have passed or may be approaching. Um, Professor Allison Conway indicated that the LSM program, their, mon right. their deadline is on Monday. So you have to kind of be sensitive to the timeline. 
When will the interim dean be announced and for how long will they be interim? I thought we heard like July 1st or something to that effect, but I don't know. So the president and the provost just spoke at the Grove School faculty meeting and said that they're in the process of speaking with people and expect to make an announcement soon, but they didn't give us a specific time frame. They also said that there will be a search conducted, that the person will be in an interim uh, mode, a search will be conducted. So knowing that a search will take at least a year and a search hasn't been started yet, that gives you some sense of how long a person would be in the interim capacity. Okay, the chair of the CE department um, noted that CE does not, does not curve grades such that a student's grade depends on the grade of another student. Is that a question? No, she, so oh. that was the chair of- Oh, uh, oh I see, okay, okay, yeah. gotcha. Um, so I am a master's student, this is my last semester and course I took a three credit project as my last course I am just wondering after submitting my final project report to my professor what should I do for the commencement I already enrolled for this commencement um, it sounds like um, I, I, I think they're talking about graduation if they have submitted in terms of graduating if they submit that um, project what else do they need to do well, generally when you, um, okay, if I'm hearing it correctly, it sounds like you've, you've graduated, you complete all the requirements for the degree, you had your graduation check and you've gotten the okay from uh, Ms. Baldry from our office in the graduate studies and then you've already applied to the registrar's office for, for graduation. If you've done all of that, then you should be good. If I understood the question correctly. What will the process for renewing C14 certification be and how quickly can we do so? So EHOS is uh, putting that in with the guidelines, the COVID-19 guidelines that everyone will have to review. Um, they are coming up with those procedures and that will be communicated prior to reopening. Are we still going to get Fridays off in the summer? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, aren't we off? Or, no, just kidding. I don't have an answer to that question. That's, once again, a, a CUNY guideline or something that an opportunity they give to us. So they may revoke that or they may say, what's the point? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Is it possible? <laughs> Sorry, is it possible to bleach the entire building? <laughs> I'm sure it is, but let's not and say we did. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I think the disinfection process, there are companies that do that. I don't know if the, the, if the college is going to do that. Will staff continue to be able to work remotely? As yeah. far as I know. Um, so I believe um, the discussion is at the point where if you're uncomfortable coming in then, and you can do your job remotely, then you will continue to do your job remotely. What we're talking about is only restarting research. So it, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, online instruction. It doesn't have anything to do with our staff and our offices. All we're talking about is restarting a small degree of lab research. I, I just want to echo, you know, what um, Dean Wesson has said, because the president's disposition is basically don't come on campus. And I think Dean Barabino made that very, very clear about unauthorized uh, being on the campus. They're very concerned about people's health. And it's not just being on campus, but also those of you who might commute, you know, you're on a train, you're on a subway, so you're a little bit more exposed. Those of us who might drive in by car, maybe a little less exposed. And so wanting to be sensitive to all the different sorts of ways in which you can sort of come in contact, you know, with the virus. And so um, I think he's um, uh, demonstrating great courses and encouraging us to do so. So I think for at least the near future, it will be, we all will be working remotely. 
I like to add while we're trying to make sure that everyone stays safe and well, and we know how people are doing, I encourage everyone, students, faculty, staff, to stay in touch with immediate supervisors, peers, let people know how, how you're doing. And we, we don't necessarily have everyone's information to reach out to everyone. So if, if each person could at least connect with a supervisor or a department chair or an advisor, that would help us to have some sense of how our community is doing. Do we still have to order the graduation honors at this time? Um, we do that automatically in terms of the cords. So we already informed the school in terms of the number of cords that we anticipate. So you don't have to purchase any graduation cords. We do that for you. Okay, and then just a comment from the chair of the civil engineering department. For students with CE specific questions, CE will be holding a second town hall meeting on Monday, June 1st from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Connection information is on the CE website. When will students who have already applied for the master's program get an announcement of being admitted or declined? We don't have a direct date on that because we've extended the deadline. Um, the turnaround time should be fairly quick because you know we're deep into the, uh, the, the admitting um, portion of our, our season. So we'll try it. If there's a problem, you can always reach out to our graduate office and we can then look into it. Or actually you can even speak to admissions. What is being done to protect senior grad students who are close to finishing research and graduating? Protect from what? I'm assuming it's to allow them to continue, like to, to move ahead to obtain their degree. I think outside of the, um, the flexible policy, everything else is in place. I'm not, that's a, I mean, I don't know really what would they need protecting from. Could they, um, you know, elaborate a little bit, unpack that a little bit? Or be more specific about what they're concerned about? We'll see if that comes in. What okay. specific actions are planned to address the upcoming budget shortfalls? <laughs> Okay, let's call, let's call the president. We don't have a definitive answer because we don't know what it's going to be. Um, and that actually translates all the way back to the state of, 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 of New York, where we get our funding from. Um, they're projecting, I think, I think the word is a $10 billion deficit for the state of New York, at which we receive our fund, funding from. And so that will translate into some impact, it certainly will impact us. So uh, don't have an answer for that question. Although we can say that we are seeking guidance and following guidance from the college and from the system, like there will be things that can and can't be done based on higher level guidance, higher than us. The president has asked for all divisions to think about areas where they might possibly be able to have some cost savings, but there are no definitive plans on where those cuts will come from at this time. And I would refer um, people to communications that have come specifically from the president about the framework he's put together for people to think about how cuts are done. And also keep in mind that there's um, an attitude that students, faculty, staff be protected and that the well-being and safety of the community be put first. So with that context and the framework that the president has provided, everyone will be looking for what are the possibilities in terms of um, how you deal with cuts. And also, we need to have information about the size of the, the potential deficits, and all of that's not yet clear. I would say, um, and I think our dean is being modest, but we have a long track record as a school of engineering of protecting our program, our faculty, and our students. 
and dealing with a lot of these major cuts. This is not the first time we've experienced cuts and still have uh, been able to maintain the quality of education and graduating fantastic students and hiring uh, very talented uh, faculty. And so we, we, we've been here for a hundred years and uh, we plan to be here for at least a millennium. <laughs> okay. Not me personally. <laughs> there was some clarification on the, the prior question. Um, Okay. Already. And it's, it, they say perhaps in terms of timelines for graduate student exams, dissertations, et cetera, are there going to be any extensions allow, extension allowances? That would have to be probably be done on a case by case basis. It's hard to say. I mean, because the way dissertations are done anyway, um, it is not on the same sort of uh, set curve as, say, for an undergraduate, when a student graduates from an undergraduate program. There's a lot more movement in that. And a lot of things have to be sort of put in place. So that would have to be determined on a case by case basis. How will social distancing be enforced in the classroom? That is a very good question. And I think that there, there are two challenges there. One, the physical space. And you know, uh, if you want to have more distance, you have to have fewer people. And so if you need fewer people, then you need more classes. And if you need more classes, you need more people to teach the classes. So that's one challenge. And then also, too, about us as being adults and being responsible and really being considerate about each other in terms of being healthy. What that's going to look like, we don't know. And that's why there's a lot of questions here. In fact, this is not only an issue for higher education, but also K through 12. As you look at some of the news around the world and Europe that uh, schools are going back and they're doing uh, social distancing with you know, grade school kids, but kids tend to listen better than some adults. And so we hope that people will be responsible and will um, um, you know, be considerate of each other to protect each other. So we don't know what that's gonna look like. And, um, and I think that that's what the challenge is right now is trying to figure out what will things look like when we sort of get back to, um, uh, I guess what people call the new norm or maybe the new abnormal, I don't know. And I think that we are also going to be going into the flex mode for the fall so that students who feel that they may still have some concerns, they, the courses would be offered online to them, even if it's not a full online instruction. Yeah. Yes. Excellent point. Will the electrical engineering department also be holding a town hall to answer its students' questions? I don't know. I think um, it would be a good idea to sort of reach out to the chief of the department. Okay, we have five more minutes. Any additional questions? I don't see anything else coming in. Any final words from the panelists? Um, there is a question on the question and answer which asks, is the Zoom link for the commencement ceremony, can it be shared with friends and families? It depends on <coughs> which technology we are going to be using. Um, if we're using a webinar, it would, up to 3,000 participants can attend. And if we are using um, the normal Zoom meeting, only 1,000 participants can attend, but we are working with the college to broadcast it through YouTube. And your families could look at it through that means. Ari Rose, any additional comments? Wrap up? Well, the, thing, the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, take good care of yourselves. I mean, um, we think that it's real important that um, as a university and as a college, we are training you not just to be engineers, but be uh, great citizens. And so we want you to, to, to be mindful um, of your emotional feelings and all of those other sorts of things to get the support that you need and to be good to yourselves. So, we have one more question. Oh, are there okay. any projected enrollment numbers known for the fall semester? And if so, are there any catastrophic as some are predicting? I haven't heard anything to that effect. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I didn't get a, a word or anything that we've seen a significant drop. I don't know. Rollins, did you see um, anything? With summer enrollment, they said that the college has increased in terms of students that have wanted to take classes in the summer as compared to last summer. And with the fall enrollment, the college is about maybe five to 800 behind where it was last fall. However, 
we don't really know what is anticipated in terms of this climate because there may be more students who would have gone out of town for an education who would choose to come to City College to pursue their degree because of the cost effectiveness and the excellent faculty that we have. Yeah, but what about the School of Engineering? You said the, the college. Um, and we don't always follow the college. Very often, we'll be a lot higher than the college. I think a, a lot of the loss is at engineering because um, we also have new admission standards. Mm -hmm. And um, with our admission standards, now students have to place into Calculus 1 to be able to come in into Grove. But we are seeing a slight uptake because we also have a summer program to help those students who come in into Grove for the fall. It's certainly nothing catastrophic for a Grove. No. Is that right, Roland? So far, that's correct. So I was going to echo what Ari, what Dean Walser was saying in that, um, yeah, take care of yourself. But what concerns me is that as we start to slowly come out and, and come in, into campus and into Steinman, that we ought to recognize that we're not out of the woods yet. And that if there are issues, if, if we do see the curve re returning or if the virus is coming back, then, then we, we will have to take means. So we want to make sure that people recognize that we're trying to do this slowly as like the city of New York is trying to do it slowly. City College is trying to do it slowly. Grove School is trying to do it slowly so that we don't take for granted the fact that there's still problems out there and we want to make sure that everyone is safe and as we reopen, we still remain safe. So let's be aware of that we're not out of the woods yet and that we're trying to stay safe for everyone. So with that, since we are almost out of time. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their participation. I'd like to thank everyone in the Grove School community for being who the Grove School is, for what Grove stands for. I'd like to pick up on what um, Dean Walser said. Grove's been around for 100 years, very strong, and it will get through this as it has through everything. It's an extremely talented and supportive community and we take care of one another so that's how we'd like to leave this town hall today knowing that our community will survive will thrive and will continue to take care of each other and continue to make the contributions that we make to the rest of the world so thanks again to everyone the session is being recorded, it will be shared, the presentations will be shared. Additional questions that people have, please just send them to any one of us and other members of the community, like advisors and department chairs and so on. So again, final thanks and stay safe and stay well. Have a good day. <laughs>